Hey leader, David Burkus here, organizational psychologist and author of four best-selling books on helping leaders and teams do their best work ever. And in this episode, we're gonna talk about the three elements of a great team culture. Why do some teams outperform others? Why are some teams more motivated, more innovative, more productive than others? Why do teams of seemingly talented individuals fall short when the sort of ragtag underdog teams rise to the occasion and are often higher performing. I mean, sometimes the high performers work, but not always. Why is that? Well, as an organizational psychologist for the better part of the last two decades, I've been looking at teams and the psychology behind how teams form, the habits, the norms of behaviors that separate the difference between the high performance ones and the mediocre or the low performing ones. And I've also collected a lot of our misconceptions about how teams operate, about how teams are supposed to operate and about what separates high performers from low performers. Misconceptions about how you build great teams. One of the biggest misconceptions is the misconception around talent. It's the idea that great teams are just collections of great talented individuals. And if you want to turn a team from low performers into high performers, you just need to add more talented team members. And this is a tempting assumption, right? Whether it's companies that are known for having you know, high signing bonuses and poaching talent from other firms, or, or sports franchises in you know, pick your sport and usually there's a team, Manchester United, the New York Yankees, et cetera, Real Madrid. There's usually a team that can just pay top dollar for top talent and eventually, some of the time, paying all of that money leads them to a championship. But for every example of that, for every company that is paying massive signing bonuses to steal talent, for every sports league that is seeing one team just outspend all of the others, there's a, an underdog team. There's a team that outperforms expectations. There's a team that, that money balls it or finds another way to attain high level performance without spending all that money. And in fact, this is what the research suggests too. Teams, if you were trying to come up with a dynamic of what explains high performing teams, the individual talent of team members is rarely it. And in fact, other research suggests why. Talent isn't portable. We know this from the research of people like Boris Groisberg, who studied migrations of talent from high level Wall Street investment firms, uh, the investment analysts who were studying industries. You would think these people would be able to migrate talent from one firm to another because their whole job was just to study an industry, to have it all up here and then watch the market and make predictions about what would happen. But what Groisberg and his team found is that as those individuals moved after a year of star performance from one firm to another, most often their talent didn't follow. In fact, they saw on average a 20% decline in talent. And as they crunched the numbers, what they found is that almost overwhelmingly, upwards of 60% of individual performance for these analysts wasn't explained by individual talent. It was explained by the team somebody was on, the company they were a part of, the resources they had access to, the networks that they managed to build or maintain as they migrated through those firms. In other words, Talent doesn't make teams, teams make the talent. Talent flows from teams. And in fact, that leads us to the second misconception about high performing teams, about great teams. And that is that great teams are the result of just team building. Now I know what you're thinking. I just smashed the talent myth, the talent delusion. So isn't the answer clearly team building? And, and I get that because we've all been through one of those sort of feel good team building sessions. It feels weird to be criticizing something that at least on the surface feels good. And that's actually the problem with a lot of team building. Whether it's trust falls or ropes courses or offsites or personality tests and big discussions, the multi-billion dollar industry of team building really hasn't delivered results. And there's a good reason for that. The reason is that unless the team building activity, no matter what it is, whether it's crossing the imaginary river on planks or taking a personality test and finding out that Mike is a big D and Sarah is a seven to the fourth power and that your personality profile, your Myers-Briggs type is NSFW. Whatever it is, if it doesn't translate from the habits and skills learned in the offsite back to the onsite, back to the day-to-day -day work of the team, then it's not an effective intervention. Team building isn't an activity. Team building is a habit. And as it turns out, we already have a word for habits, for norms of behavior, for the regular occurrences that guide individual behaviors and, and create a collective 
sense of team norms and behavior. We call ongoing habits and norms, we call it culture. And when we look at the research on culture on great teams, this is where we start to find our explanation. This is where we start to separate out low performing, mediocre performing teams from great teams. When you look at the research on high performing teams, you find three elements. You find that almost every high performing team is marked by common understanding, by a sense of psychological safety, and by a known pro-social purpose that underlies everything that they do. Let's take those three in turn. Common understanding, common, this, one, this one seems like it's easy to understand. It's the extent to which members of a team have a commonly held perspective on each other's knowledge, skills, abilities, their roles and responsibilities. That rhymed and I didn't intend for it to. They have a sense of their work preferences, of how each other likes to work, the context that they're working in. They know what a request for help looks like and what a request for feedback looks like and they know how to provide those things without offending the other person. Common understanding is not just clarity of roles, it's bigger than that. Clarity of roles is important, but clarity of person, clarity of understanding each other and how each other would like to work is massive. And that's what we mean when we say common understanding. You know, I think about common understanding and I think about, uh, well, I think about Chris Hatfield. Uh, Chris Hatfield, you may know him as the astronaut famous for making that David Bowie lip sync video and all of these other viral videos from the International Space Station. But Chris Hatfield is known inside the space community as one of the most successful commanders of a mission to the ISS ever. Chris led a team of himself, a Canadian, two Americans, and two Russians. So he led a team of three different cultures, three different languages, right? English, Russian, and American. Three, five very different people from three very different cultures, and he had to get them to a place of common understanding. Not just clarity of roles and responsibilities. NASA training, European Space Agency training, Canadian Space the, the Agency training focuses on clarity of roles. There's checklists for everything. But Chris knew he had to take care of the soft stuff of common understanding. So he spent time living in the United States with the two astronauts that he would part for. He moved to Russia, he learned Russian. Spent time living not in a hotel, not in just agency houses, but in, but in state housing with the two astronauts, cosmonauts, that he was going to take off with. He had the team work together to develop common understanding, to understand each other's preferences, each other's moods, each other's personalities. He even had the team role play what they would do in certain disaster situations, like whether or not a team member experienced the loss of a loved one while they were up in space in a tin can traveling around the Earth at 17,000 miles per hour. And interestingly enough, tragically enough, that actually happened. While they were on the International Space Station, one of the members of the crew found out that one of their close family members died and the only people they had to rely on for support were the other astronauts who were prepared for that because Hatfield spent so much time building common understanding. Now you may not uh, ever be going to space with only four other people. You may not need to build that deep of a sense of common understanding, but there are things you need to do on your team to turn it into a great team to build common understanding. And my favorite intervention for this is, is a huddle, the practice of a regular huddle. You could call this a daily stand-up in the world of agile software development, that's what they call it. You could call it the, the weekly check-in, wh whatever you wanna call it. But this is not a one-on-one -on -one check-in. This is a huddle, this is the whole team coming together. The best ones look at whatever period of time has passed, day, week, two weeks, and they have everybody share just a little bit. What did I just work on? What am I focused on next? And what's blocking my progress? And, and it seems like three simple questions, but there's so much information in those three questions. What did I just work on? What did I complete? Where are we? What's our sense of progress? What am I focused on now, which helps you as the leader understand that nobody is dropping the ball? And what's blocking my progress? Which is a way of asking for help without having to admit any failure. It's a way of letting the team opt in to provide that help or provide that feedback. It's a way of helping the team. These three questions are of helping the team work out loud so that everybody's aware of what everybody's doing. And over time, the huddles grow into a, a place where people are sharing their work preferences, giving each other feedback, providing help, and building a sense of common understanding. Now, right alongside that sense of common understanding needs to be a sense of psychological safety. You're not gonna get to a place beyond clarity of roles in common understanding without building a sense of psychological safety. This is the extent to which members of a team feel safe to take risks, to express themselves fully, to admit failures. It's a sense of whether or not people are hiding their failures or hiding parts of their full selves or whether they're actually free to express that all. And the reasons for this are obvious, right? When you face a problem, if people aren't willing to speak up, 
to express dissent, to give you the diversity of their ideas, then you are limited in your knowledge of possible solutions. If we talk a lot these days about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, th and there's a strong sort of moral case to be made for that in and of itself, but if you are not building psychological safety alongside your attempt to build increasing diversity in your teams, then you're not benefiting from that diversity. What does it matter if a bunch of people who have a, a wide range of surface level diversity are all afraid to share the benefit of their diverse perspectives and lived experiences and knowledge, skills, and ability? It doesn't matter. Without psychological safety, diversity is a moot point. So we know we need to be building psychological safety. When I think about psychological safety, I think about the way Alan Mulally built psychological safety among the senior leadership team and the whole organization of Ford during his turnaround years. Mulally took over Ford in the early 2000s at a time when the company was losing billions of dollars. In fact, the year he took over, they were on pace to lose $17 billion. If they just maintained present course, they would still have lost $17 billion dollars. Mulally was committed to demonstrating psychological safety, to letting people speak up. In fact, on his first day, he was asked by a reporter, what kind of car do you drive, Mr. Mulally? And he replied, I drive a Lexus. It's the finest car on the market. His point was that he was going to be honest even when it hurt. His point was that they, Ford, as an organization, were not in a leadership position yet. I hope we'll get there, but we need to be honest about the fact that we're not there. And one of the things that Mulally did was he started a regular, what he called a business process review where the senior leadership team of the organization met every Thursday morning, every Thursday morning, and shared their progress, what the plans were, whether or not they were on track. If this sounds a lot like a huddle, it's because it's exactly like a huddle. He had them come together and share what are they focused on, what's blocking their progress, and he asked every leader in the organization to color code their slides giving the progress update. Green would mean we're on track, everything's fine. Yellow would mean we've got some setbacks, but we know how to solve them, and red, would mean we've got some setbacks and we have no clue how to overcome them, we need help. And when he started the business process review, the very first day, he saw 300 green lights. Everyone's slides were green. Everybody said, here's the plan, here's where we're at. Everyone was afraid, in other words, to share what was going on. There was a culture of fear that if you spoke up and you admitted those problems, you were out the door. And this is why the company was losing $17 billion. This went on for eight full weeks, despite Mulally's admonishment that surely something must be wrong because we're losing this much money. It just continued. It just went on. Until finally, on the ninth week, one executive, Mark Fields, decided to switch to red decided to talk about a problem in one of the production plants in, in Ontario, Canada, and talk about all of the cars that were sitting on the lot because they didn't have the tools and the supplies necessary to fix the production problem that was going on. And Mulally, you know, looked at Mark Fields and the whole room must have expected this was the last we're ever gonna see of Mark. But Mulally said, this is great because we can get, come together and solve this problem. He focused the whole team on solving that one problem. And as a result, they got Mark and his team back on track. But they left the business process review, I'm sure everyone thinking, last time we're ever going to see Mark, except next week, when they filed into the same conference room for the same huddle, and they found that Mark Fields was sitting at Alan Mulally's right hand. Mulally was sending the message, it's okay to speak up. In fact, I prefer it. The following week, you can imagine what happened. We finally had the rainbow of lights that we needed to actually have an honest conversation to turn the company around. Executives came with all sorts of different colors, reds, yellows, greens, all sorts of different problems, and we finally had psychological safety on the team. And that helped turn the company around from losing $17 billion when Alan Mulally took over to a profit of six to seven billion dollars when he finally stepped down as CEO. And by the way, when he stepped down as CEO, do you know who he, who he appointed? He appointed Mark Fields, the first person to take the risk as a symbol that we are going to reward psychological safety on this team. Now, okay, you might not be trying to turn around a company, turn it into a great one, try and not lose $17 billion, but I bet there's some steps you can take on your team to build a sense of psychological safety. And if you wanna do that, here's my biggest advice for you. Encourage dissent. Just like Alan Mulally encouraged people to finally speak up when there were problems, you ought to encourage people to express dissent with your ideas. When you're in a leadership role, suggestions become orders, right? Random ideas turn into fixed principles, and we want to get away from that. We want people to feel free to speak up and disagree with us when we call for it. But the way we ask matters, right? I see a lot of people encourage dissent 
just by saying, hey, anybody disagree? Any other ideas? Instead of taking the burden on themselves, right? So try this, flip it to something like, hey, we're, it sounds like we're heading towards consensus, but I know that I have my own biases. I have my own knowledge, skills, and abilities. I have my own perspectives, and that might be creating my own blind spots. So what am I missing? I know I have some blind spots. Can anyone help me find them? That's what I mean when I say encourage dissent. And as you build common understanding and you build psychological safety, you'll get a team that is performing a bit better, but they'll be even more motivated to give more effort if you add pro-social purpose as the third and final element of a great team culture. What is pro-social purpose? This is the extent to which members of a team feel that they're making a meaningful contribution to work that matters. A meaningful contribution to work that matters, work that benefits others. The benefiting others is a key piece here. It's not enough to have the purpose of growth or the way we're gonna change the industry. The research suggests that we are most motivated when we know who benefits from the work that we do, whether that's external customers, internal customers, or some other stakeholder. When we have a name and a face, a, a vivid conceptualization of who is the direct beneficiary of our work. You know, I think about pro-social purpose, I think about building this, and I think about the way that KPMG, the big four accounting firm, turned around their employee satisfaction numbers. They had done everything that we talk about doing in engagement literature. They increased raises, added extended family leave time, all sorts of other benefits. And that moved the needle a little bit, but they had reached a plateau. And so they decided to try something crazy. They launched what they called the We Shape History campaign, which was dedicated to telling the stories of the way that KPMG as an organization had shaped history. They talked about the way that KPMG was involved in the Lend-Lease Act, which was the way that the Americans first entered World War II, not through direct combat, but by lending and leasing equipment, supplies, resources to the Allies. And do you know who managed all of the logistics of that? KPMG. They talked about when Nelson Mandela was released from prison and ran and was elected the first black president of South Africa. Do you know who certified those election results? Do you know who ran the audit? It was KPMG. They talked about the cleanup after 9-11, the insurance contracts, the recovery efforts, multi-billions of dollars just to help victims' families recover from the greatest tragedy they had seen in their lifetime. And do you know who helped manage all of that? KPMG. They were committed to telling these stories. They even made posters that outlined them and hung them all over the place. But these aren't just those sort of pretty normal motivational posters because of what happened next. Once people were familiar with the imagery of how KPMG as a whole organization shaped history, they went to the next level. They went personal. They launched what they called a 10,000 Stories Challenge. And the idea of the 10,000 Stories Challenge was to capture 10,000 different ways that their almost 30,000 employees shaped individual histories. How did they help farmers through making sure that credit availability was there? How did they help cybersecurity through things like forensic accounting or through helping organizations understand where their vulnerability points were? They launched an app to help people design their own posters that could demonstrate those exact things. They wanted 10,000 stories. They got more than 40 thousand stories. And when they looked at the data, when they did their next round of employee engagement surveys, they found something really interesting. Yes, they increased employee satisfaction. They increased the sense of pride of working at KPMG. But that was almost entirely determined by people who answered one question in the affirmative. My manager has regular conversations about the purpose behind the work that we do. In other words, it wasn't about the high level organizational intervention. It was about the team and the individual leader of the team and whether or not they built a sense of pro-social purpose. Okay, so you may not be trying to demonstrate the ways in which your organization shapes history, but you can take smaller steps to connect your team with the direct beneficiaries of their work. Whether that's reading a letter you got from a customer or bringing the customer in, in person or virtually, to talk to the actual team and thank them. Whether that's sharing an email from senior leadership thanking you and your team for the great work that we're doing. Anything you can do to put a name and a vivid sense of who behind the purpose that you do will build that pro-social sense of purpose and lead your team to greater levels of motivation. And as you build that sense of pro-social purpose, you pair it with psychological safety and common understanding, you'll find that these aren't just three pillars. These things interact, they act synergistically. You'll find that as you develop a reputation for a leader who builds cultures that are marked by common understanding and pro-social purpose, you attract the best people to you. You attract highly motivated people who want to do their best work. And as you build common understanding and you build psychological safety, you'll find that you get your people's best ideas. They feel free to share, to give each other feedback, and that makes them perform even better. And when you build psychological safety and you build pro-social purpose, 
you'll find that you get your people's best effort as well. In other words, when you build common understanding, psychological safety, and pro-social purpose, you'll find that you've started to lead your best team ever.